uh, of RSA security and how to build the very conference you're, you're attending. I'm um, here with Secretary Shertoff and others. I'll have to introduce themselves in, in a moment. Um, but uh, thank you for uh, thank you for coming out this afternoon. Uh, our purpose here today is to take advantage of the RSA conference where uh, Jen Easterly and, and Chris Inglis have been speaking over the last couple of days uh, and express our support and the support of our organizations on their efforts to form a public-private partnership. For roughly 18 years since President Bush put the strategy to secure cyberspace out in 2003, um, the government and the private sector have been talking about just such a partnership. And we believe for the first time we have an administration that has the talent and the wherewithal and the engagement from the public sector uh, to really make a difference in terms of, uh, of protecting our critical infrastructure and, and protecting, uh, protecting the country. So uh, with, with that statement, I'll, I'll turn to my colleagues on the right and ask them to introduce themselves. First, I'm Megan Stiefel. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Institute for Security and Technology. We are a Bay Area-based nonprofit. I'm Bill Reichman. Uh, I am a uh, private equity investor in cybersecurity companies and a member of Business Executives for National Security, otherwise known as BENS. And uh, General uh, Joe Botel is a uh, proud signatory to the statement. Greg Rattray, I run a cybersecurity consulting group called Next Peak, but for the purposes of this, I'm the executive director of the Multilateral Cyber Action. And as I mentioned, I'm Art Coviello, former CEO of RSA and a member of the Multilateral Cybersecurity Action Committee. Secretary. Yeah, Michael Chertoff, I used to be Secretary of Homeland Security, and I run a consulting home called the Chertoff Group that does a lot of work in cyber with the, both the private sector and, and government. So hopefully you will have uh, received the, the, the press release and, and the statement that we made and happy to, happy to take any questions or all right, I'll also pleased to give you a monologue. Anyone? I guess my big question is how do you actualize this? Like these are great recommendations. but how do you move them forward? So we, we believe that the only way to actualize it is with engagement from the, the private sector, and that's what's been lacking. We, we now have, with, the, with CISA and the JCDC, uh, a structure and a framework for this kind of, uh, of engagement. And the way we actualize it is with the meeting that actually just ended, which was a meeting of the JCDC uh, participants, uh, which number, what, 25 today? I think approximately. Uh, and we need to expand that. We need to expand it vigorously to include more and more companies and get their engagement on, on, the, very, on the very aspects of the statement that we made. Are there certain sectors that you think are missing from the business that you see that would like a lot of um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll take a you know, thought and then Secretary Church, I think also the notion of other ways we can help yeah. on the public yeah. private partnership. In terms of the JCDC's composition, I think it's very well engaged with the technology industry and the cybersecurity uh, industries. They've also you know, got members from a lot of the large, important infrastructures. But I think one of the things that we're trying to do is get the broader business community you know, engaged uh, in, in this. And I think that's important, including the, the middle market and small, and trying to figure out how to make that scale work is part of what it, we're hopeful that we can bring to to it, and you know we are working on while we have uh, the business executives for national security, other business organizations that will you know help us reach out to the business community. And then I think as we look down the road further, apart from the immediate issues we're dealing with, we hope to engage the private sector in thinking a little bit about some of the strategic challenges that are uh, relevant to cybersecurity. You know, we've done an earlier, in an earlier iteration of our group, we've done a paper on the supply chain and the importance of having alternatives to, let's say, Huawei when it comes to moving the hardware and software for our telecoms. We need to continue to think about what are the strategic investments government and the private sector have to make to create a more robust supply chain, to have alternatives. 
uh, how do we prepare ourselves for what artificial intelligence may mean in terms of cybersecurity and what you want uh, as it may affect uh, cryptography. So I think there are things we need to get the private sector to think about and engage with the government in on looking at not just the immediate set of problems, but in the further horizon. So one question that always has been, we've been talking about public-private partnerships, I think, actually since the Clinton administration when I was involved with that, that's how long. So one of the interesting questions for the general counsels are the liability issue. Yeah. So what's your approach to thinking through the liability issue and a safe harbor issue? And the second part is, as you know, at the, for the defense industrial base, they've always asserted that privity has stopped them from being able to go farther down the chain. And many of us have said, well, maybe you should do the Defense Production Act, that if the President has the power to do that. Where do you guys stand on those, those two issues? So the legal liability issue is a thorny one, and that's why this has been so difficult to accomplish. Um, I, I think there's a lot of activity within, within the uh, CISA and within the administration to work with companies um, to to um, get the legal constructs right, to be able to share information and be able to work uh, together in a constructive way. And again, this, this statement today is, is just the beginning of our, of our advocacy, and those are issues that we will need to address uh, and, and we'll plan on addressing. The, the other thing that's clear, Chris, Chris Inglis, I think in his, uh, in his uh, panel discussion today made clear that we have silos of, uh, of defense elements, whether it's in the private sector or, or, or even within government and, and across government. And no one sector uh, can defend itself. And it's critically important that even the private sector get involved in the sharing of information. And the perfect example that he gave, quite frankly, was the solar winds attack. Uh, the solar winds attack was discovered uh, by Mandiant Corporation, uh, and they're the ones that blew the whistle on on that attack by the by the Russians and shared that information, uh, bringing the uh, bringing the whole issue to it to its head. Another thing that that Jen brought out in the same panel uh, was the reaction to Log 4J uh, this past uh, late fall, early winter, whenever it, whenever it occurred, and the ability to move quickly. Uh, and help companies uh, get around uh, and, uh, and patch and do what was necessary to uh, mitigate the potential effects of Log 4J. Sure. So it's already started. Yes, as you know, the legal counsel advised Mandy not to inform anyone. I'm sorry? The legal counsel actually informed him not to inform anyone because he didn't have, that was the legal advice that he overruled to the board. So the interesting question is also, where do you stand on the Defense Production Act? Are you guys going to support as you have to actually operationalize the concept to have that as a something that the president should invoke? Yeah, I think these are the kinds of things we have to look at yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, both in the short term again and in the long term. But we know in the past, you know, if you look at DARPA, for example, the government has either put money directly in or created a market for or done other things in order to promote investment in certain areas. And by the way, this is something that you know we can talk about not just as the US standing alone, but with our like-minded partners, um, where you have a lot of technology there too. Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of, I think, strategic issues we'd like to get the private sector more engaged in. I'm afraid I have to run to another appointment, but Thanks. please go ahead and see you yeah. later. See you. Greg, see you later. Yeah. Harvey, I'll see you, you later. Excellent. Yeah, one of, one of the things that, that we are acutely aware of is, is that the United States and, and most of uh, the West, and I use the term West um, in a broadest possible sense, and include Japan and the Far East and the West, uh, but uh, we're the ones living in the largest digital glass houses, and we have the most, the most to lose. So uh, we see our advocacy going beyond just protecting the critical infrastructure of the U.S. and and pushing forward out to the rest of the world community uh, to uh, to cooperate more effectively. Sure. Yeah. Other other questions? Do you? I, I have tons of questions. But I'll let Go you ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other <laughs> thing is, um, 
Do you have any models out there that you think are particularly powerful? The Israeli model, the Finnish model, uh, other countries have been much more forward leading in the understanding of this being a co sort of problem for both the private sector and the government. Do you see anything that you guys say? This we understand the principles, but we want to go down that road. So there's, a, there's actually a, a, a really good model that, that existed in the U.S. that was classified at one time, and that's the Enduring Security Framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and this goes back mm -hmm. at least eight years, I think. Yeah, yeah I think it's a little longer than that. A little longer than that, in, in which the Department of Homeland Security and, and the NSA cooperated with the, uh, the technology community to point out vulnerabilities in, mm -hmm. in their products that could be exploited uh, and it, it worked very effectively, and that work continues to this day. And one of the things that, as, as we go forward uh, to, again, address the question you raise is how do you actualize this? Yeah. Um, we believe we're going to need to reach out to various constituencies, the technology community, the financial services community, the healthcare community, uh, and understand the needs and, and what they can add back to the government. This is not going to be just a, a government to industry and private sector problem. Matter of fact, more often than not, the resources to protect ourselves exist more in the private sector than even in the public sector. So it, it's, this, it's this collaboration, and again, that's something that Chris has emphasized over and over again, the collaboration uh, aspect of, uh, of what, what's trying to be accomplished here. But make no mistake about it, that actualizing this and, and some of the points you brought up, there's a reason why we haven't effectively had a public-private partnership for, for 18 years. But it's, it's, we've gone past the point where we can, we can sit by with the stakes as high as they are. Hmm. There, there's not a, a business entity, for that matter, individual, that hasn't, hasn't seen a radical transformation in their lives and in their organizations as a result of the digital transformation that's taken place over the last 20 odd years. And that transformation is only going to accelerate. And, and I like to think that as a technologist, that, uh, that the 20s will be the roaring 20s for technology as we compound innovation on top of innovation, but it'll be the calamitous 20s uh, for cyber if we don't do a better job cooperating with, uh, with one another. Uh, on models a bit, yeah. um, you know, as you, you highlighted it. I think a challenge in the United States is just the legal structures that separate the government and the, and the private sector. So I think we won't be able to emulate, emulate the Estonian or the Israeli models just because of the way the government and the private sector interact. Um, but, you know, I think we all believe that we've got to figure out how to get farther down that road, you know, especially the Estonian model. Yeah. Where I think some model development is done is, you know, and Megan, we talked about this, IST is the sponsor for the Ransomware Task Force. Mm -hmm. If you read the, their reports right. and the notion of hubs, and, you know, the, these hubs can be in the private sector or the government, but they, they you know, they come together on in a specific situation to deal with action, you know, to take care of that situation. I led the New York Cyber Task Force recently, and you know, again, and Michael Daniel, who's one of the members, one of the co-chairs of the Ransomware Task Force, you know, was a big influence on that finding also to build, you know, these collaboration hubs. So we've got, and those hubs exist, like, uh, you know, ISACs, an information sharing and analysis organization, CT, Cyber Threat, uh, alliance, you know, there are there are operational hubs. So if we could figure out how to get the JCDC to leverage the hubs, they don't all have to become members of the JCDC. And you know, we picked a couple elements that were actually solarium elements in terms of um, <clears throat> in the in the, in the uh, solarium commission report. It's called the joint collaborative environment. I'm a former Air Force officer. I call it common operating picture, right? But this common understanding, if the hubs had the same picture, particularly in urgent you know, national crises, we, we would be able to do a lot, a lot better. Like, again, I think JCDC made some progress with Shields Up, you know, but I think there's also room for what to do in Shields Up, expand it out to a broader community. So you know, I think model-wise, it's not 
to exactly emulate another country's model, but to leverage our current structures much more effectively, in particular at much greater scale. Sure. What do you think uh, Ben's is going to do? Uh, General Votel is quite vocal on a range of issues. How do you see Ben's participating and leveraging this initiative? Um, I, I think Ben's hopefully serves as a model. Ben's is a public-private partnership that's been in existence for a long time uh, and, uh, and serves its clients, which are primarily DOD and uh, uh, and uh, DOJ uh, very well, and that's it's a great example of how the open lines of communication um, and uh, and the tremendous resource that is the business community um, can be leveraged to improve efficiencies um, at government. So it's and you know those issues that that we've been addressing aren't as they're critical, but they're different from the cyber issue, which is what we're addressing here. Um, but I think there are some models um, from Ben's that can be learned and brought to the table to sort of enhance this effort. Anyone else? We applaud you. We applaud your, uh, I would say, optimism <laughs> and vigor on this issue. We have to do it now. I mean, I totally agree with Art. This is like I mean, Art may be right, absolutely correct. The timing is such that there's enough people of a coalition of the willing to move forward on it. You know? you know, my experience, you know, uh, having served on the NSC staff, you know, for President Bush, you know, 2002, right, one of those early warriors at, at the public private partnership that thought we just got to keep going. Like, this is something we need to establish, right? For a lot of reasons, some of which we've discussed, we are at the point, it's not deep enough in my estimation, and I've spent a lot of energy over the last you know, 20 years, but particularly uh, a lot of what I did at J.P. Morgan was focused on deepening, and then I think some progress was made in that sector, but only for the very big players. Like, we've just got to keep at it, and you know, we've got to find the right tipping point of the right co confluence of you know, incentives I, for everybody to go at it. Yeah, so. I, I hate to use a cliche, but you know, the, the proverbial how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, um, I, I think is, is operative here. And, and I, I want to give you an example, and, and naturally, given uh, that I'm an alumnus of, of RSA um, and take great pride, um, back in, I think, roughly 2013 or 14, um, we invited a number of our multinational bank and financial institution companies to the conference, and we presented the the director of the FSISAC with the Public Policy Award that year, and we convened the FSISAC with these multinational financial institutions and got them together and say, why can't we do this internationally? And there was a, a blocking function called the Department of the Treasury. Um, so what happened as a result of this meeting was that the FSISAC petitioned the Department of the Treasury to allow FSISEC membership <clears throat> to be broadened to the international community within limits. For instance, Russian banks were not in it, um, nor are Iranian banks in it. But, but the, the, the banks of like-minded nations are all now in the FSISEC. So that level of information sharing exists, and that's just an example of how, how things, how you can get action if you bring the right people together with the right intention. That's a great example. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks. Well done, guys. Thanks. And Thank you. Well